I forgot what they were called. Uh, the photo initiators. Yes. Um, so do they just speed up the process, or are they like, a, you have to have them? You have to have them. So if, so, so if I just took... Um, so if you just take a monomer... And you just oh, sorry, it, you're going to teach, right? Yeah, if you just took like the monomer and you just like kept it out in the sunlight all day, it would just stay the exact same unless you combined it with the... Yes, so oh, okay. the, photo, the photo initiator is essential to actually trigger... Okay, so that simplifies the, like the storage and handling of the monomer. Exactly. So that is extremely important because without that photo initiator, you would not be able to trigger the cross-linking reaction. Right. There are other things that you need to, they normally need to add. One of those things, as you can easily understand, if you are irradiating something with light, the light can just be scattered right. okay, in that polymer. So you need to be able to concentrate that energy. Hmm. So you normally add, on top of the monomer and the photo initiator, the photo absorbance. And, oh, that, okay. and that is important to, because without the photo absorbance, sorry for the delay today. <laughs> For each layer, you're adding like an absorbent no, no, no. material. It's just, it's just, um, you have this vat, this container, right. and it just pour this resin into it. So you're not adding layer by layer. It's already mixed. It's already uh, right. a right. solution. Okay. In right. simple terms, it's already a solution. Where you have the monomers. Um, let's just go talk outside, sure. so that I can let my colleague start his latch. <laughs> You wouldn't be the first time that I would take it home. Well, not really home, but I'll, I'll go to my office and... Oh, God. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> oh, no, no. Do you know how many, how many times this happened to me? You just put the microphone and then... You're not the only one or the... No, no, no. Because then you, you, start, you start talking and then you just, just leave the room with the microphone. Somebody will come running after you and say, oh, you're stealing this. Someone did steal the uni microphone last semester. Oh yeah, not just last semester, apparently, even before the beginning of this semester. Oh yeah, you can make money out of it. Do you know that they, they now bring them in in the, in the, in the morning? They were stealing these. That's why they had a lot of them. Oh. Why don't we have a lecture? Well, they have it on camera. They just move uh, back to the police. We had a lecture. Sorry, thank you very much. Thank you. ایرانی شما جرس سوال میمدید کمان چطوره؟ من؟ من شیراز شیرازی؟ من شیراز درس کنم کهی اومدید اینجا؟ خالجو اومدید یا؟ چهار شد من تاز شد چطوره دکچه خوبه چیزاشو بلد این چیزایی که درست جدی؟ آره خب پس بگی سریعتر بیش برای چیزایی ماتیکسو هم بلد همه شو همه شو اینورسان بلد این؟ همه شو بلد حتی آیگن بلیو هم بسیم گفتن؟ چی گفتن؟ آیگن بلیو چی؟ آیگن بلیو نگفت نمیدونم چی بلی کن اینورسو بسیم اینورسو آیدنتیتیو اینا رو همه شو Maybe not.
Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to the third lecture of the numerical methods and computations. Okay, so we are starting 10 minutes past 5, right? No, 7 minutes. <coughs> so, <coughs> we are going to continue with the uh, with matrix trans matrix, uh, sorry, inverse. But before that, let's have a very quick recap of what we talked about last week. So we said that we have an identity matrix of size n. So we have a square matrix n by n. So the elements on the main diagonal are 1, and the rest of the elements are 0. So this is the identity matrix. And we said that just similar to what we have in the, for the scalars, if we have matrix A, and we can find the inverse of that matrix, then A inverse multiplied by A is equal to A multiplied by A inverse, and that is equal to the identity matrix of the same size. Okay? So this is the motivation for us to find this inverse of A, A superscript minus 1, which is A inverse. But we said that before that, we have to learn how to compute the determinant of a matrix. So we continued with it, and we had this definition. So if we have an n by n a square matrix, A, the determinant of that is going to be defined by this formula. So we have a summation over the columns of that matrix. So we said that we can uh, expand around any row or ele uh, uh, column of matrix A. Okay? So now that I'm saying J, J is the counter of the column, so it can be the rows. So somehow we should choose the row or column around which we are going to expand. Okay? So if you choose the rows, then you have the summation over the columns and the other way around. So this Mij that is going to appear here is called the minors of the matrix. So we have Aij as the element on the ith row and jth column of A. And corresponding to this Aij, we are going to have Mij. This is the minor of A. And then this Mij multiplied by minus 1 to the power A plus J is going to be called the cofactor of the Aij. And Mij, how do we find it? So each time we are going to ignore the i row and the j column of the original matrix and find the determinant of the remaining part of that original matrix. So which means that we have to uh, do this several times in order to be able to, comp to calculate the determinant of the matrix easily. So usually if we get to the dimension of two or three by hand, we can just quickly ca calculate that. So this is for the special case of size two in the middle, you see that? So we can just expand around the first row. Or for the special case of three, doesn't matter around which of the rows or columns you are going to expand, and that use that original formula. For both cases of n equals two and three, we came up with a kind of a quick way of computing or calculating the determinant of a matrix. So for instance, for three, we said that, okay, the first two columns are going to be kind of added or augmented to the right of the matrix, and then we are going to have three uh, diagonal with plus sign. We just multiply the elements of over those diagonals minus this, I mean, the, the, the multiplication of the elements over three diagonals from the other side, okay, starting from the top right. So is there any question up to this point? Very good. So here is a homework. So we, if we have the upper triangular matrix, which means that the main diagonal are non-zero and all the elements above that. But below it, we are going to have all the elements zero. So we call it upper tri uh, triangular. So the question is that if you want to compute the determinant of this, what do you do? What's the best strategy to calculate the determinant if you are going to use the original formula? 
So around which row or element you are going to expand. So around the one that we are going to spend like more effort, right? So around the first row, if, if sorry, first column. So only one element is non-zero, right? So the rest are zero. Just so that summation that we have we had in the ca calculation of the term is going to have only one non-zero element. I mean the rest are zero. So this is n by n. So if you do that, then you are going to calculate the determinant of a matrix that has a size of n minus 1 by n minus 1. But imagine what happens if you remove the first row, first column. So the re remaining one is again upper triangular, but of size n minus 1, right? So again, you expand around A22. So only one term again. So you just continue it until you have uh, like a three by three matrix or something like that. So it's like a systematic way of calculating the determinant, right? So you can come up with this idea about the computational uh, cost of the determinant of the upper tri triangular mat matrix. So if you remember, for the summation of two matrices, we had uh, n square for the multiplication n cube, but here in this case we have n factorial. Okay? You can show it. I mean, just try to apply the formula with that hint that I tried to explain. So, very good. We set all, all the things about the determinant to come to this idea how to calculate the inverse of a matrix. So now we are going to continue our discussion from here. <coughs> but before that, I forgot to say something about the So some properties of the determinant. So if we have two matrices A and B, and we can multiply them, so what do you think about the determinant of the multiplication of the two matrices? So we can show that this is equal to the multiplication of the determinants of the two matrices. Okay. Again, don't forget that the term is just a number. Okay, it's, it's like a scalar. So it's property one. So the second property is that if we have a Bullock diagonal matrix, so we call this Bullock diagonal matrix, which means that A11 and A22, they can be matrices themselves. Then the determinant of A is going to be equal to the determinant of the blocks. Somehow it makes sense, right? Because we have them on the main diagonal and the uh, the other off-diagonal elements are zero. So how about the connection between the determinant of the matrix and its transpose? What do you think about it? So if we have A and then calculate its transpose, what would be the determinant of A transpose? Is it equal to determinant of A? Yes. And this is something that you can easily show. So as I recall, A transpose is the matrix where we just switch the rows and uh, columns of A. So if 
a is n by n and c is a scalar. Then the determinant of the c a is going to be c to the power n determinant of a. Okay? Because we said that if you have a scalar multiplied by a matrix, it means that this scalar is going to be multiplied by all the elements of the matrix. And it makes sense that when you calculate the, the determinant, you are going to have this c to the power n because we have this multiplicity of n, n, n times multiplicity of c. And the last one, and the last one, last property is that determinants of A inverse. What do you think about this? So is A inverse is the inverse of matrix A, and this is one over determinant of A. Okay? So it's just a reciprocal of the determinant of the original matrix. So A, A transpose. So just as a recall. So we know this, that A inverse multiplied by A is I. So if you take the determinant of the both sides and then use the first property at the top that about the determinant of the multiplication of two matrices, you can easily get this expression. All right? So any question up to this point? So by the way, I, I Yes, please. Um, I don't understand the difference between a transpose matrix and an adjacent matrix. You mean here? Um, no, on the slide. Uh -huh. um, there's an adjacent matrix and a uh, transpose matrix, and I don't understand the difference between the two. You're talking about here? So about these properties, which one? The first one? I'm just asking what uh, an adjoint matrix is. No, okay, we, we didn't talk about We were just writing here. Sorry. So we were talking about these properties of the determinants. Okay? So now, we said all the things about the determinant to come to the point of finding a procedure, an algorithm to calculate the inverse of a matrix. But before that, we have to define one thing that is called adjoint matrix. So we consider A to be N by N then the adjoint of A is again a matrix which has elements C, I, J. Do you remember where, what, what was C, I, J? So if we had A, I, J as elements of matrix A, C, I, J was the cofactor of A, I, J. Yes, sorry, I didn't say. Fair? Yes? This Cij is minus i to the power i plus j. This is exactly what we had when we calculated the determinant, right? Yes. And Mij. Yes. And Mij was the minors of, minor of Aij. Yes, this is the determinant. Yes. After removal of the, of the a, i, th and j th I, I throw and j th column of a. Yes. OK? So it was the cofactor of Aij. So this is basically the definition that we have. So basically, it says that if you are calculating the cofactors to calculate the determinant, do not throw them away. You are going to put them in a matrix. And then, in the end, you should transpose it. Don't forget about this transpose here. 
okay? And by this, you are going to get the adjoint of original matrix A. Fine? So this is exactly, it gives me what I need. Because if I have adjoint matrix, I'm at the position of, so by the way, this Mij is the minor of Aij. Now we can calculate the inverse of a matrix. So something that we were seeking from the beginning. So it's one over determinant of A, which we learned how to calculate, multiplied. So this is a scalar, right? This determinant of A. Multiplied by the adjoint of A, which is a matrix of the same shape as original matrix A. So if we have A n by n as a square matrix, the adjoint of this matrix is going to have the same shape as A. Okay? So when we divide this by a scalar, which is the determinant of A, we are going to get the inverse of the original matrix A. So any question about these two? So again, you should understand how to calculate the minors. Once you have the minors, you just multiply them by minus 1 to the power i plus j, you get the cofactor Cij. When you have them, put them in a matrix. When you have all the elements, just transpose it. You are going to get the adjoint of matrix A. And of course, if you have Cij, you can calculate the determinant. So everything's connected, and the core to everything is what? Determinant of A. And we said that it's like a gradual thing. You should just go down to the probably second or third order matrices. Sorry, matrices of size two or three, which are easy to, to handle. So, any question, comment? If not, then let's go through an example that you have it in the slides, but it's very good to just we also look at it here. Okay. So we have a three by three matrix. Yes, please. Yeah, exactly. So when we, when, yes, it's one element. But when we put it in the bracket, it becomes the matrix. Cij is the element that is located at the ith row and jth element of matrix C. So if you put Cij within brackets and say that, okay, i is changing from 1 to n and j, is, j also from 1 to n, then you define the whole matrix. So it's like an abbreviation to, to so if, let, let me go back to it. So Cij alone is just one element. But if you put bracket around it, it's just a whole matrix. C. No, no, no. OK. This is like a convention I guess we had in the first lecture. That kind of implicitly what I mean here is that I is changing from 1 to n, and j also 1 to n. So, but we omitted that. Okay? But, but it's a good point. Cij is an element, but we, when we put brackets, what we mean implicitly is just the matrix as a whole, because we assume i and j are changing over associated dimension. Okay, now we go to, to the example. So we have a three by three ma matrix, okay? And all elements of the matrix are real numbers. So we want to calculate the, the, the inverse of the matrix. 
And we said that if you want to calculate A inverse, we should find two things. First one is the adjoint of the matrix and also the determinant of A. And we said that this adjoint of A is Cij transposed and Cij is minus 1 I plus J Mij and these are the minors. Okay? So first let's start from the determinant of A. Do you remember the last thing that we said in the last lecture? So we said that if we have this 3 by 3 matrix, okay, we just consider these two first columns and kind of copy them here, right? Then we say that, okay, so we multiply this plus multiply this plus multiply this and then subtract from it multiplication of this plus multiplication of this and this. It was like a fast way of calculating three by three, I mean the, the, the terminal of three by three matrix. So if you do that, okay, minus one multiplied by minus one, minus three minus one is plus three multiplied by six is 18, right? And next one, five multiplied by two minus two is minus 20, and then we have four multiplied by seven by four hundred twelve, and then we have with the minus sign five multiplied by seven by six, and we just continue it. So what we get is a scalar as we expected, which is the determinant of A. So the actual task is here to calculate nine cofactors, okay? So we just follow the definition that we have for each of these elements. Again, when we say C11, we are pointing exactly to one scalar that is the element at the first row, first column of C, matrix C, okay? So it's just one value. So we use this formula, as it is here, minus one, okay, I is one, J is one, so one plus one, so minor, M11, M11, okay. It means that if we consider this original matrix, we are going to ignore the first row and the first column, okay? And then calculate the determinant of the remaining part, which is a two by two matrix. And for that, we said that we have to multiply the elements on the main diagonal and subtract from it the multiplication of the off diagonal elements, okay? Then it, this is exactly what we do. So the remaining part is this, minus one, two, four, six, minus one, two, four, six, and the determinant of this is minus six, minus two multiplied by eight, by four, which is eight. So let's take this one, three by two. So, okay, minus one, i is three, j is two, okay, three by two. Minus one to the power of five is minus one. We are going to calculate the determinant of matrix A after removing its third row and second column, okay? Third row, second column. So what is remaining is minus three, seven, four, two. So does everyone agree with me? Yes. Very good. So. The rest is just, okay, again, multiply by this by this, minus three by two, which is minus six, minus four multiplied by seven, minus 28, okay? You do this, I mean, for all nine elements, you get matrix C, but don't forget that you have to calculate the transpose of that to get adjoint of A, all right? This is exactly, this is the adjoint of A, and this guy minus 84 is the determinant of A. So we actually, we follow the definition that we had there.
So any question? Okay, if not, let's quickly see how we can use MATLAB for this type of things. I hope you see it. Do you see the cursor? Is it clear? Okay. Okay, so let's define a three by three matrix. So we said that we put brackets two, four, comma six. So this is the first row. I'm going to put a column to go to the next row. So what should I put? Minus three, nine, then one, minus seven. Okay, I have a three by three matrix. So, what would be the determinant, the command to ca calculate the determinant of A? Sir? Yeah? Debt, open bracket, <coughs> A. No, debt, D E T. Yes. D -E -T. Yes. <laughs> okay? So, debt, parentheses, A. You get the determinant of A. So how do we get the adjoint of A? So just write adjoint parenthesis A. And how about the inverse of A? Just inv parenthesis Okay? This is also another thing. So you can write a to the power minus 1. Again, it works as inverse a. Okay? So in the end, I mean, what we are learning in this course is just we should understand what's happening behind these comments, right? about the mathematics and a bit of the computation. But if you come to use MATLAB, I mean, of course, I mean, in practice you can just use this kind of high level commands and just do the operation. But you should learn also how to implement the basic algorithms in this course. So I guess on Thursday we have our first tutorial, so we should try something in MATLAB, okay? So with this, we are going to finish this uh, elementary discussion about matrices and move on to the something, something very interesting. That is called eigenvalue problem. So are you familiar with them? Do you have any prior experience with eigen modes, eigen decomposition, eigen values? Very good. So, in this lecture and at least two more lectures from now, we are going to learn about this, okay? So, this is the plan. Today we are going to start from a motivational example, why we should learn about eigenvalues and what actually they are. And then we learn uh, mathematical approaches and algorithms to calculate them for, for a given matrix. And in the end, we are going to have a few examples with practical relevance to see how, what type of problems in practice uh, are connected to, to, to this uh, eigenvalue decomposition. So I'm going to just briefly talk about this. So there, it was John 
Fitzgerald in 1826 built a bridge near Manchester. So we are somehow here, so, okay, somewhere here. So it was built here in 1826. But after five years, something happened to it. Okay? And it was rebuilt because it collapsed in 1831. And this is the first picture that we probably have from it in 1883. Uh, this is kind of after 1924, it looks like this. So the thing that happened was that on that particular day in 1931, there was a group of soldiers who were marching over the bridge, okay? And because of the kind of very regular kind of way of marching that that pattern, something happened. It generated a vibration and it led to the collapsing of the whole structure. But why it happened? The thing is that the systems that we have, I mean, in, in, probably you have courses in vibration, this type of thing, you will learn about it. We usually have a, so there's a YouTube video here, please watch it, it's very interesting. It's about the, 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 the bridges, we kind of move with the wind and oscillate a lot and sometimes this oscillation, the amplitude of that oscillation that can be so high that the whole structure may collapse. So we have this type of uh, problem. So in the most basic and simplified version, we have a mass M, okay, and we have a spring which is kind of fixed at one end and to the other end is connected to the math, mass. So if we release this mass, without any external forcing, and we have an ideal spring with a constant k that is fixed, what happens is that we are going to get a harmonic oscillation for that weight m, okay? Of course, instead of releasing it from equilibrium, we can have some kind of a forcing. And the forcing can be, for instance, with my hand, okay? So with some initial movement, some initial velocity and initial displacement. And of course, this is going to be enforced with a given frequency. That is the forcing frequency. But the thing is that the, the system itself, without any forcing, has a natural frequency that we call this omega zero, okay? And that is the square root of k, that is the spring constant over mass m. So can you, okay, that those bridges, for instance, they can be modeled, but not as simple as this, but they can be kind of modeled using this kind of weight, spring, dampers, and probably some more complicated elements. So you can think about the suspension system in the cars, in the buses, for instance. We have a lot of this type, uh, many, many different types of this, uh, this applications. But anyway, any system that is vibrating has, an, has a natural frequency that is omega zero, okay? The square root of spring constant over mass m. So it has a value, right? But just imagine that we are going to force the system with some initial amplitude u. And we are, what we are going to measure is this transmissibility, which is the, uh, the, the size of the or the, the magnitude of the output of the system, which is the displacement of mass m, x, over the size or the magnitude of the input, which in this case is the amplitude of the force in u. Okay? This is not the subject of this course, but what can show that it can be one over one minus omega i or omega zero squared. And what is omega a? This is the frequency of the forcing. This is some kind of external forcing. So we are not going just to release the system from equilibrium. We are going to give it an initial movement with amplitude u with some velocity, with some frequency, and just release it, okay? But it's a mathematical expression. As we said, this g is going to measure the size of the output to the input. What's gonna happen if omega a, the, 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 the <coughs> forcing frequency, is close to the natural frequency of the system. Yeah. 
Yes, please. Hmm? Why? Because the... Well, head towards zero on the bottom. Exactly. Exactly. So if this omega a goes toward omega zero, then the denominator of this expression is going towards zero. So, but we have a fixed value at the at numerator, so the value of g is going to increase quickly, which means that we are going to, the system is going to experience some resonance. You have heard about resonance? So we have a natural frequency and external frequency. When that external frequency gets close to this, then we get this uh, quick increase in the amplitude of the oscillation or the output of the system. So as you see here, so this is the ratio omega a to omega zero. When it becomes close to one, we are going to have very quick increase in g. But if we are below one, <coughs> see that, I mean, this g is going to decrease with this value. So this is like a motivational example. Why we did talk about it? The, the thing is that we have dynamical systems. I don't know if you have heard about them or not, but dynamical systems are the systems which evolve over time. Okay? So it can be anything. I mean, any, any time-dependent system is a dynamical system. So we can think about this very simple case here, which is a linear system, linear dynamical system. So why is the solution variable? It can be a vector. So we have the time dependency of this y equals to some matrix multiplied by y. Okay? And this is exactly the connection of what we talked about it as just introduction, the connection of that to the matrices. So we have this matrix A here, right? And we want to see if this system is in equilibrium, and I just perturb it a bit, what's going to happen? whether or not this perturbation is going to lead to some kind of burst over time, some very quick increase in the amplitude of the system, or no, it's just going to quickly be damped and nothing happens just after a few oscillations when the system stops again. And everything about this stability analysis of the system, because we want to see if the system is stable or unstable, is about this matrix A, in order to study such a stability, we are going to look at the eigenvalues of A. And that's exactly the reason we are going to look into this eigen decomposition of a matrix A. And I guess in the rest of your study here, you are going to see a lot of examples where these eigenvalues, eigenmodes are important, where, where you have matrices. I mean, usually we are interested in computing the eigenvalues. Because somehow, roughly speaking, instead of working with the matrix, you can quickly work with the eigenvalues. So for instance, a matrix three by three has three eigenvalues. Just work with that. Uh, that can be kind of representative of all properties of A. Okay. <clears throat> but, but do you know the meaning of eigen? Any German speaker here? So it means own or self or something like that. So it's something that returns to A itself. Okay. So this is what we have. A x is equal to lambda x. A is a matrix, and X is the eigenvector. Lambda is going to be the eigenvalue.
Okay. So we are going to talk about matrix eigenvalue problems. So if you have matrix A and vector X, I have to put an underline, which means a vector, okay? And then we have this scalar lambda X. So this own or self meaning for this eigen is clear from here. So whatever happens as a result of applying matrix A to vector X, it's going to be the same as multiplying this scalar lambda to, to that vector X. So we are going to call these eigenpairs. So this is lambda and X. This is the eigenvalue and this is eigenvector, sometimes eigenfunction, sometimes eigenmode. I mean, there, there are different names, but we just call it eigenvector. And we, we said the vectors are just uh, 1D matrices. And here in particular, we are talking about column vectors. So when we calculate this eigenvalue lambda associated to that, there exists a, a, an eigenvector. So something that is called eigenvalue problem, or in abbreviation, eigen EVP. So what happens is that, let, uh, let me bring the expression on the right-hand side to the left-hand side. So AX minus lambda X is zero. I put it underline the zero because it's, it's a vector similar to X. Okay? By the way, this N, I, sorry, A for now, just assume it N is N by N, and this X is N by one. So this multiplication is allowed because these inner dimensions are the same. Okay? And now I can write this lambda i x zero. Okay? I take this x which is common factor between these two expressions outside. So now I have a matrix that is called A minus lambda I. This is something that I would like to call it B, and this is again N by N, right? And this X is N by one, and this zero is also N by one. So I have this expression. B multiplied by X is zero. So what does it imply? Can you tell? Sorry? Well, I is the identity matrix. Yes? Inverse of I? A? What? Okay. Close. Yes, yes. So we have a matrix multiplied by a vector is zero. And we would like to have a non-trivial solution for this system, which means that we don't want to get some x equals zero. This is kind of trivial solution. Okay, in order to get something non-trivial, not necessarily zero, we should say that, okay, this guy doesn't exist. I mean, the inverse of this doesn't exist. You know what? Why? So I'm going to write it here. So this Bx is zero, right? If B inverse exists, then multiply both sides from left by B inverse. So it's B inverse BX equals B inverse zero. So of course this is zero. And this is going to be I, right? By definition, B inverse B is I. 
So this will result in the trivial solution. Oh, sorry. Actually, I changed my pen. I f is it better than the previous one? OK. Did you get that? We have b multiplied by x is 0. If inverse of b exists, we can multiply the expression from left by b inverse. If we do that, b inverse b is i. And this is going to result in x equals 0, which is kind of a trivial solution. We don't care about x is 0. So in order to avoid this trivial solution of x equals 0, we should make sure that b inverse doesn't exist. So in order to get non-trivial solution, b inverse shouldn't exist. And b inverse is adjoint of b divided by determinant of b. So in order for b inverse not to, be, to, to exist, what do we need to have here? Yeah, determinant of b has to be 0. Divided by zero what? Doesn't dividing by zero lead to no value? Yeah, exactly. So we so if you want this expression not to exist. You have to divide it by zero. Exactly. Okay. So this determinant of B has to be zero. Yes. And this gives us what we need. Don't forget what B was. B is A minus lambda I. So therefore is a minus i lambda has to be 0. And here I do not have an underline under 0 because it's scalar. We are talking about the determinant. So the whole story is about this, how to calculate the eigenvalues, how to calculate the eigenvector. It's just about this expression. So yes? Sorry? Yes, but we started 10 minutes late. I mean, that's the issue that you, I mean, your previous class is going to finish kind of late. But that's why we are a bit, I mean, behind the schedule. 